you all here. Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. We're thrilled to be able to offer today's event in partnership with Marin General Hospital. And um, we'd like to thank our other sponsors, uh, Wells Fargo, North Bay Women Magazine, San Domenico, Urban Spice Nutrition, and Power of Pleasure for helping to make, to make today's event possible. As we age, a lot of things in our bodies start changing, which um, lead to us not feeling quite ourselves always. We're very fortunate to have Sonia and alone with us today to help us make some smart choices about what we eat so that we start feeling our best as much as possible. Uh, a bit about Sonia. She is the owner of a nutrition consulting firm providing individual consultations, group programs, and corporate workshops to her clients in the food and biotech industries. She's an expert in assisting people with cardiovascular disease, specializing in the clinical management of inflammatory conditions related to non-LGE food sensitivities, such as irritable bowel syndrome, migraine, fibromyalgia, and arthritis. She's a member of several Academy Dietetic practice groups and chaired and was spokesperson for the Nutrition Committee of the American Heart Association, San Francisco Division. I'm very pl privileged to introduce Sonia to you today. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is my pleasure and privilege <laughs> to be here. And I will tell you that my uh, presentation style is a little bit informal. And although the structure is I have about 45 minutes, and then we have about 15 minutes at the end for question and answer, if you have a question that's pressing, Please feel free to raise your hand, because um, I do like some interaction, and I don't, if there's something that you, that you need answered now, feel free to let me know. Um, so I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, and that's kind of my b background. And I practice integrative and functional medicine nutrition. And what I look for is really getting at the root cause of why someone doesn't feel well. And I work with the doctors in the community. You know, I don't, I don't have a website, and I'll just tell you that already. Um, I have three boys, and they keep me busy. And so you know, when I'm at home, I'm, well, I work, obviously, at home at, at night. But, um, so I haven't really done that. I don't advertise. But I, I, I am either word of mouth or physician referral. But what I try to do is get to the root of the problem. And I have people who will come, and you know, their doctor doesn't know why they have a pain here or there, or why they're bloated, or, or you know, whatever. And so we kind of look at, you know, how does your body function optimally and why isn't it working now? So that's just to give you a frame of reference of what my background and how I like to work. So I don't have a lot of slides because I'd rather speak to you since that is kind of why we're here. <laughs> so I'm not going to be reading much. This is more just to kind of, you know, kind of give you an outline of where I am frame of reference to speak from. You do have a handout that I developed, and it's, it's green on top. And it does have some of the points. And I'm, I'm letting you know now, so you don't feel like you have to write. Because there are two slides that have details of what can I do or what do I need to eat more of. Because I want to leave you with some practical information. I'm not going to just say, you know, these are the problems and da, da, da. I want you to know, well, so what can I do? I want you to all leave with maybe one idea of you know, one action plan of what can I do, what can I eat more of, or what can I do less of to make me feel good. So aging, um, I'm not here to tell you that you know, I, I can, there's a way to prevent it, because we're all aging. But when I, we were looking at this topic and coming up with potential um, names, one of the, one, the names that came out was you know, aging, how to age gracefully. And I thought, the image that conjured in my mind was of a, an old lady in a rocking chair as age just kind of washes over her. And I thought, I don't think anybody really has that attitude. I think we want to know, not necessarily how to be aggressive, but I like the word outsmart, how to outsmart the aging, aging process, because you can do that. And what I hope you will see by the end is that you, you have a role, and you can make a difference in how you age. And I think we all know people who are older than they look and we all know people who are younger than they look. And hopefully we'll get to the bottom of why some of those, why that happens and what you can do about it so that hopefully you can 
feel well as you age, because I think that's the goal, is it's not always the number of years, but it's the life in those years. And so that's what I want to help convey. So there are a lot of theories on aging. You know, what, what is aging exactly? Because if we can know why we age and how we age, then we can come up with ways that we can maybe make a, a dent in that aging process, or we can affect the change. And we know that 15 to 20% of aging is basically genetically predetermined. You know, a lot of times people who look real young have parents who tend to look on the young side. And that is a role. But what I will tell you is that in terms of genetics, we used to think that genes really determined our health or our outcome from longevity to chronic disease. And many people still think that. So if you have a family history, let's say you know, your parent passed away at 55 of a, a massive heart attack, suddenly now you have a family history of heart disease and premature heart disease. And we used to think, ugh, that means I'm going to have premature heart disease. I might, might as well eat whatever I want. I'm going to just have a heart attack anyway. So we used to think that 70% of our health was really genetically determined, and only 30% was environmental, or basically what you could do. And what we've learned over the years, and with large studies like the Human Genome Project, uh, is that really 70% of, of what happens to you is within your control. 30% is genetically predetermined. So we're really realizing that environment and lifestyle choices can make a huge impact. Depending on the studies that you look at, depending on cancers, anywhere from 35 to 70 percent of cancers are lifestyle and diet related. I mean, that's pretty impressive. What that means is, is that you can do something about it. 50 percent of heart disease is diet related. And depending on the study, um, there are some studies that have shown, you know, following certain types of diets can reduce heart disease by 85 percent. So the point is, is that yes, you can do something. And starting when you leave today, you can do something. And again, it's a pr pr I want to help you really achieve and maintain optimal health. And hopefully you'll see how you can do that. We know that inflammation is probably one of the biggest determinants of aging. And inflammation we can either see as an acute inflammatory response, like when you get a paper cut and you see it get red, there might be a little pus, that's your immune system sending out white blood cells to that cut to kill those bacterial invaders so that the bacteria doesn't get into your body and then you know, wreak havoc in the rest of your body. So that's acute. But what happens when stress happens, when you don't eat well, you don't exercise well, you gain weight, etc.? Those are more chronic types of inflammation. And so you don't notice them immediately, but they, ha they do have long-term implications, and especially for aging. We know now that inflammation is the root cause of most every chronic disease. It's the common thread. How many of you know that osteoporosis is an inflammatory disease? It's not about calcium and vitamin D. I mean, those do play a role, but it's an inflammatory disease. Um, can I, I'm going to use this real quick, because what I'm going to do is I, on the back of your sheet, I tried to give you a, a list of resources that I find that are really helpful, because you may have questions like, well, how do I, you know, can you talk more about osteoporosis as an inflammatory disease? I don't get it. You can, there's some resources here that will help explain it, and I'll try to mention them as I go along. And you can also always just Google, you know, osteoporosis plus inflammation. Um, heart disease, we now know, is an inflammatory condition. It starts in your arteries, they somehow get damaged, and then with time, you have cells that come to try to repair that damage, and what happens is, is you have plaque buildup, it can rupture, and all these white blood cells come to try to repair it, and you have a clot that can get dislodged and travel either to your heart or to your brain, cause a stroke. And so what's important then is really diet and your health and a gut, having your intestines that are healthy. How many of you heard how health begins in your gut? <laughs> Yay. So it's true. And what people don't, how many of you heard that 70% of your immune system is in your gut? So not as many. What does that mean? That means that you better have a healthy gut. And not everybody does. Why? Well, because alcohol actually can harm your gut. Um, uh, lifestyle choices, um, what you eat, what you don't eat. <clears throat> there's there's a, a big study that, that was, it's actually now done, but it was a human microbiome project. Anybody hear about that? And it really wanted to look at the bacteria in your gut. Do you know that we have trillions of bacteria in our intestines? They have a symbiotic relationship with us, but they affect our health. They can either, depending on the type of bacteria, 
you want to have a good balance of good and bad bacteria. And if you don't have as many good bacteria and you have more bad, that can contribute to heart disease, obesity, all kinds of other, um, other illnesses. One way is, anybody here of Firmicutes or Bacteroidetes bacteria? Good. So there are a couple, there are many, many different strains, and we are learning you know, more about the role of the microbiome every day. But Firmicutes, you can think of it as um, kind of a fat type of bacteria, and it tends to extract more calories from your food. So you don't want as many Firmicutes. And what they found is that looking at lean people versus overweight people, people who are lean tend to have more Bacteroides versus Firmicutes. And that if you can change that ratio, through different ways that you can actually, that can help with weight. And that's what a lot of the actually newest research is coming out now, is looking at how your gut microbiome can affect weight. And part of it is just what types of bacteria are in there, which is why, you know, some people will take probiotics, but they'll take single strain probiotics. You know, you have thousands in your gut. The, the bacteria in your gut outnumbers your own body cells 10 to 1. So there's many more bacteria. Any idea how, much, how many different species of bacteria are just in your mouth? I hear a number? 10,300. I thought that was, <laughs> but 300? I know, you were just aiming high because you knew it was gonna be crazy. But how many of you really thought that there are 300 different critters, types of bacteria in your mouth? And that's not, you know, that's still with good oral hygiene. So that's not because you don't brush. So I think that's pretty amazing. So it matters, and the reason why our gut microbiome gets out of balance is our lifestyle. It's eating foods that are overprocessed. it's getting trans fats, it's getting too much sugar, it's you know, not exercising. Um, how about antibiotics? You know, if you don't get them from your food, how many of us have been on antibiotics? Probably most of everybody. And it's not always because we want to, but if we have some kind of serious infection, we take an antibiotic, thank goodness for antibiotics, but they tend to get overused. Now, not just in the field of medicine, but how about antibacterial soaps, right? So, you know, what we've learned is that you really don't want to be exposed to antibiotics as much as possible. You want to use it when you need to. Otherwise, you know, we get antibiotic resistance, et cetera. So, um, that's about all the micro. And I, again, I have 45 minutes to talk to you about so many things that I could talk to you all day about. So I'm going to maybe leave you with a few questions you can either ask me later, or um, again, you can look at some of the resources. Um, and if I get to them, I will let you know. Okay. So lab markers. So how many of you have regular lab work done? Once a year, maybe you get an annual physical. So how many of you have lab work that looks particularly at a particular condition? Let's say you have a family history of heart disease and you're wanting to look. So I want to give you a couple things to look for. You can think about the ones that you look at. So in general, we tend to have you know, CBC, you know, complete metabolic count, et cetera. And they give us an idea of our kidneys and our liver and how everything's working. But there are a few things that affect aging specifically. And one is insulin. How many of you have, have your, know what your fasting insulin is? Excellent. I have, what, three people? <laughs> okay, it's a good thing to know. The reason why is, you know what the role of insulin is, right? So what happens when you eat food, it's usually a, it's a blend of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. The carbohydrates will break down into glucose. Glucose is blood sugar. It needs to get into your cells so that they can use it for energy. How does it get in? So you have you know, sugar in your blood, and you don't want sugar to last in your blood because it's damage, damaging to your vessels. So insulin gets secreted from your pancreas, and it picks up the glucose, and it opens the muscle cell, puts the glucose in, and then it kind of recycles back. Well, there's a condition called insulin resistance. You've heard of that. One in three Americans now, I think, have it. What happens is, is your insulin isn't as effective or efficient as it used to be. So it picks up the glucose, it goes to your muscle cell, but the, muscle doesn't, the cell doesn't recognize it, so it can't open it to dump its sugar in. So now it goes to the next, next door, to the next cell, tries to put it in there, but your cell is resistant to that insulin. So now your body says, wait, wait, the glucose is piling up, it's not clearing like it should. Pancreas secrete more insulin, so it secretes more insulin to try to clear that sugar out of your blood. You know, again, it can damage your kidneys, it damages your eyes, et cetera, That's all the markers of diabetes. So what happens is a lot of times you might have your fasting blood sugar measured, and it might be with under 100, which is ideal. 
but what you don't realize is that your insulin is really high just to keep that blood sugar normal, that your pancreas is about to go, that it's working as hard as it can, it's secreting a lot of insulin, and very soon, you'll, you'll become diabetic. You know, that that, so things don't just happen overnight, so it's important to know your insulin, and if it's high, do things to help bring it down so that your muscles then recognize it and it'll clear more effectively. The other thing is, Alzheimer's is a disease of aging, and I think people are nervous about Alzheimer's because at the moment there isn't a cure for it. There are some studies looking at different diet and lifestyle parameters, but one of the risks is having an elevated <laughs> insulin. And Alzheimer's is also known as diabetes type 3. Have you heard that? So Alzheimer's disease, my husband's a neuropsychologist, so this area is very near and dear to my heart, so I, you know, I, we have our offices in the same place, and so I very much am always asking him about brain health and you know, how do we maintain it. But so Alzheimer's is known as diabetes type 3. When your insulin goes very high, what happens in your brain is the insulin decreases. And so, oh, that, that, that's, that's not mine, is it? <laughs> so your insulin decreases, and what happens is, is that your brain doesn't function right. And so what you want is you want, to be, you want to have normal insulin in your blood so it can use the sugar and it doesn't tend to build up. So if you lower your blood insulin level, you can then optimize your brain insulin level, decreases your risk for Alzheimer's as well. Okay. So um, insulin. How about CRP? Anybody ever have your C-reactive protein measured? Mm -hmm. Two or three? So CRP is sort of a general inflammatory marker. And we use it a lot when we look at people who have heart disease so that we can see, you know, do they have inflammation? And if so, you know, what can we do about it? But it's really important to know because, again, the more inflammation, the more damage that's happening in your body. There's another test. So when I work with people, I actually, with the physicians I work with, I can order labs. And I really like to order from a company called Boston Heart Diagnostics. I don't know if anybody has heard of that <laughs> company. But it's really the most comprehensive test. I don't work for them, I don't get anything from them, but I use the information and this is how. So I get all the lipid panels, but I also will get CRP. So CRP will give me an idea if there's inflammation. And then there's another number that I look at under LPPLA2. And LPPLA2 measures inflammation on the plaque that's in your artery. Because if the plaque on your artery is unstable, if it's inflamed and unstable, guess what? It's more likely to rupture. And if it ruptures, the content spews out into your arteries. Your body tries to block that, and that's when you have a heart attack usually ensues after that. If somebody has an elevated CRP and an LP, PLA2, they have an 11-fold increased risk of stroke. So if you have a risk for stroke in your family, make sure that you're looking at some of these inflammatory markers. Fibrinogen is another one. It's a clotting factor. Um, it's important to know, um, I, like I mentioned, some of the diabetes markers, insulin, not just, at just your, your blood sugar. That's not enough. Uh, after that, I like to look at homocysteine. Anybody hear of homocysteine? A couple. So homocysteine is actually an intermediary of protein metabolism. And what happens is, if your homocysteine is elevated, it's kind of like shards of glass inside your artery. It's actually damaging. And again, what happens when something gets damaged, like if you get scratches on your skin, you have inflammation. That happens inside your arteries as well. So homocysteine is very much a nutrition-related problem because typically it means that you have a methylation defect. Does anybody know what that is, a methylation defect? Has anybody had, their, had a test done for MTHFR? Just one? Okay, so MTHFR, it's methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. It's an enzyme, and the enzyme breaks down, helps break down folate, which is a B vitamin in like green leafy vegetables, so that your body can then activate it. But methylation is basically adding a methyl group so that your body can activate a chemical. And in this case, it's a B vitamin folate. 40% of the population has some form of methylation defect. And what that means is they aren't able to fully activate their B vitamin, in this case folate, because what folate needs to do is it needs to be activated so that then it can activate B12. And it, they basically hold hands when they're both activated and they break down homocysteine. So people who have high homocysteine can be because they have the enzyme deficiency, the MTHFR deficiency, or they don't eat enough folate, so they're not getting enough of it to begin with, or they don't get enough B12, or what else happens when we get older? We don't make as much stomach acid. 
And so after 50, especially, I mean, it doesn't just, you know, it doesn't just drop off the map at 50, but slowly our stomach acid decreases. So what's significant about that? What's important about stomach acid? Because most people think, oh, it's heartburn, right? Stomach acid helps you absorb B12 because B12 is bound to protein. And in order for you to absorb that B12, you need to cleave it off so that it can get absorbed. And for people who don't have enough stomach acid, they can't cleave it off, so it tends to get excreted, and so then they're low in B12. So it may not be a methylation defect. But I look for it, especially when I have clients with interesting histories, complications. You know, I have this one client who has had four different kinds of cancers, and his lifestyle is good, his diet's good, but you know, kidney cancer at four, and then he had some kind of melanoma, and then, and then he had heart disease, and, an, and he had osteoporosis at like 59. I'm thinking, something's just not right here. He has a very significant methylation defect, and there are things you can do about it. So if any of you have any interesting medical histories, and it's, it's worth looking into, because what you can do is often look more, more, deep, more deeply into sort of all the pathways and figure out exactly where the defects are. But for some people, it can be taking activated B vitamins. So when I, I'll talk about some supplements in a, in a minute, but it's looking for the activated forms, not using Centrum or Centrum, you know, Centrum, Centrum, Silver, because the quality of the nutrients in there aren't very good. They're all the inactive ones, um, the, the synthetic vitamin E, which, and it's only one form of vitamin E, so enough about that. Yes? <laughs> yes, question? So how do we, as normal, average people, ask our doctors for the panel, like what's the panel called for our Well, if you're kind of young and healthy, you probably won't get the Boston Heart panel. Unfortunately, if you're a male and you're a little older and there's family history, you're more likely to get it. But you know, women don't tend to think, and, and some physicians don't tend to think of women as having heart disease. And after 55, it surpasses breast cancer, you know, in terms of women and, and issues. What you can go in is you can say, it's be, and, I, and I really encourage this, be, be vocal with your physician. Be a good partner with your doctor. Because you, just like you would want your doctor to explain things and talk to you, the doctor wants that, like most, want that from you as well. And so you can go in and say, so this is my family history, or these are things I'm concerned about, and I'm wondering if on my next blood test we can order a few of these markers. I'd like to keep track of them. And most of the doctors I work with are okay with that, unless it's some really off-the-wall, expensive, you know, unnecessary medical test. But if you even start with, like, um, CRP or, in, or, or insulin? I don't know why they'd say no. Now, Boston Heart is just, you know, there's, there has to be some indication for ordering it. Is that something you track yearly, or how often are you looking at this? It, all the markers I'm talking about? So I, I want a baseline. And so then if there's something out of balance, then we start, start supporting you with diet or whatever, then yes, you would measure it again. If it's a nutrient deficiency, it could be in three months. If it's something else, it could be six months, or it could be in a year, too. It just depends on what the parameters are. Um, I will say also that um, if you have, and there are some nutrients that are harder to, to actually get an, a sense of, like vitamin B12. B12, if you just measure it in your blood, may seem elevated. And I've had clients come to me, and the doctor's like, oh, stop taking your B12, you know, you're fine. Or, or it's, it's elevated, you've got to stop taking it. So if you have an elevated B12 in your blood, the assumption might be you're taking too much, right? But actually, what my assumption is, is you probably have a methylation defect. The reason for that is because the B12 is in your blood, and it's not getting converted to its active form and getting into your cell. So your cell is probably deficient. And I had a client recently as well who had neuropathy, you know, pain, pain and tingling in the feet and toes. And the, this person's vitamin B12 was elevated. And I'm thinking that's a mismatch. And so we did a methylation test. And sure enough, methylation defects. And I put this person on a methylated B complex, and their neuropathy went away. You know, they, can, they tried to get it from their diet, but sometimes it's hard to get enough at that point, especially if you're trying to replete a deficiency. Again, this person was 70 years old. And with decreased stomach acid and decreased B12 absorption, Chances are that just giving a B12 anyway isn't going to be effective. Okay, yeah. What is a Methylcobalamin. So cobalamin is B12. And if you look on, like if you have any supplements at home, any multiple vitamin, mineral, or B complex, look on there. If you see cyanocobalamin, that's the inactive form or the synthetic form of B12, you want a methylcobalamin. 
And so, sure, and so most of professional lines of supplement companies or really good quality supplement manufacturers will use methylcobalamin, um, methylfolate, so that it's not just you know, folic acid. And if you have a methylation defect, you never want to take folic acid. And I'm going to touch on how many of you get frustrated with the kind of inconsistencies or the um, seemingly controversies in nutrition. It's like, okay, first you can't eat this, and now it's red meat, and, and you know, wh wh let's just forget it all, right? <laughs> Keep in mind, because I've worked with the media a lot, um, the media sometimes will put headlines that had nothing to do with the study, that were not the conclusions of the study. But it, what, now what, with, with social media and all that, it's about the number of hits, it's about the number of you know, contacts, and did you open the article, because then they get, you know, right? So um, there isn't as much controversy. Yes, there is confusion. But um, I just actually saw a study this morning on how um, I think it's the FTC is cracking down on supplement companies because there really is no oversight. People think that supplement manufacturers have oversight. The FDA doesn't monitor them like they do drugs. They just ha so supplement manufacturers are just responsible for nothing, actually. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the FDA um, tests supplements for food. Safety, right. But not yeah, so they aren't going to go and test, you know, if you're making a B complex, they're not going to go in and check. Their, companies are responsible for good manufacturing processes, but many of them don't follow it because why? Who's really coming over? I mean, if you're a company and nobody's checking, then, well, if you are, let's say, a sports enhancer, what if you just put a little bit of stimulant in there? Who's going to really know? But the people are going to buy it. They're going to feel really good and say, I really like this. I have to buy more of it. And, and indeed, they just um, are cracking down on, there was one that was an athletic enhancer of some kind, and there were some specific ones, but they, f you know, and you've probably seen the news once in a while where they'll find drugs that are added to supplements, which is why I don't like to just use over-the-counter, for the most part, supplements, unless I know the company or it has a good reputation, et cetera. I study every day, and my kids look at me like, didn't you go to school? <laughs> and, and, and I remember my older one, when he was so mad once, because his teacher, didn't explain something right. He said, I'm gonna have to go home and read this and figure it out on my own. I'm like, yeah, that's what you learn in school is to learn how to learn. That's what I do all the time. So a lot of the physicians aren't trained that way. I mean, it's enough just to get to medical school. And I will say that we are, our healthcare system is really a disease care system. If you get, if you have trauma, you're in an accident, we have a fabulous hospital. You know, we, you, if you're injured in some major way or you have cancer or you need surgery, you will get well taken care of. But how about the most of us who just want to lead a long, healthy life and we want to prevent disease? We don't necessarily want to get to know our good doctors, at least not yet. <laughs> um, I know they're great, but I, you know, I don't want to end up in seeing my cardiologist because I get a second chance because I have, you know, I had a heart attack. Because you know, about 40% of people don't get a second chance. They, do they drop dead of a heart attack, unfortunately. So the physicians I work with have known me and worked with me long enough. They send me their, heart, their patients, they can't get better. Like um, this one person who actually had the methylation defect, he also had high blood pressure, he'd had a heart attack, and um, had reflux. And so one of the things I do is I also work with people who have inflammatory conditions and food sensitivities. So I kind of put them on this elimination diet where I got rid of things that were tested to be problems, and then you kind of get them better. Then we start adding foods to build a safe diet. He went off his blood pressure medicines and he got, lost his reflux. There was another physician in the community who was actually a friend. And so I said, if you pay for the test, I'll help you. And so, because this was in the beginning where it's like, oh, I got to show somebody here that, you know, they, they need to see that I know what I'm talking about. So he had major reflux where he took Prilosec, I think, which, you know, you're not supposed to take more than three weeks. That's the, the warning label on the bottle, but most people take it for life. And so he still would have breakthrough reflux at night. So he'd have to not only have it elevate, the bed elevated, he'd have to wake up and take Mylanta. So he was tired from having to wake up to take Mylanta. And he also had irritable bowel syndrome. So he never knew when he was going to have explosive diarrhea. And he liked to play golf. And so he always knew where the bathrooms were, had extra change of clothes. Now, some of those issues can be very, you know, very much medically. But a lot of them are food related as well. Not, it, it, didn't take, it was less than a week when we identified what the problems were. He didn't have reflux and he, hasn't had, and he doesn't have bowel syndrome anymore. Now, I don't often tell that because I don't want people to think that I'm any kind of miracle worker. I'm not. I approach health from a nutrition perspective. I have a nutrition lens, and that's how I look at things. 
not everything is nutrition related. So I wish it were, um, but I will say that a lot of it is. And so some of them will just come to me um, because like I had a cardiologist the other day, Here's a, and, or the, the, the patients don't want to take drugs. He said, oh, you're gonna need a statin. I don't want a statin. Okay, here's Sonia, <laughs> and you, know, you can work with her. So anyway, does that kind of answer the question? There are some integrated physicians on in the community. Yes, and I'm just getting to that. So thank you for that segue. Um, so, so in, in, in what you bring up is a really good, did everybody hear that? That you know, we're supposed to be having an antioxidant rich diet, but then not that long ago we saw the antioxidants feed, so, feed cancer, so does sugar. Does that mean if you eat sugar you get cancer? Does that mean if you take antioxidants you get cancer? No, but this is what it means. And bottom line, food first, which is why I have the rainbow of colors in front of you is that it's really important to get your foods because these foods here, does anybody know what these are? Yes, oh, dandelion greens. It's important to include a variety, not just lettuce, which is you know, certainly good, but you wanna include bitters because they have natural antioxidants that don't tend to feed cancer. It's when you take antioxidant supplements, that's what tends to feed cancer. That's sort of that, that difference. When you eat, these foods, these will decrease your risk for cancer. Does that make sense? Now, anyone know the recommendation for how many fruits and vegetables, and don't look at this, to eat a day? <laughs> well, that's a lot. So the recommendation from the government is five. And so if you eat three, people are like, well, okay, that's pretty good, I'm almost five. You really should be eating eight to 10, eight to 10 servings. And a serving isn't huge, it's not like 10 salads but it's eight to 10 servings. If you do that, you will get the antioxidants that you need, especially if you're having a variety of produce that will help decrease your risk for heart disease. It keeps you healthy from the inside out. It helps decrease aging from the inside out because your body has the ability to do that, to, to not be succumb to the ravages so quickly. Um, Susie. Really quick, what does um, eight to 10 mean? Does that mean eight cups? Does that mean eight, eight to eight 10 cups? serving. So a serving, a serving is typically a cup of lettuce. So yeah, a cup of raw greens, but then if it's cooked, I mean, you see spinach, right? You go from this to like this. So it's like a half a cup if it's cooked, you know, broccoli, cauliflower. I don't recommend all raw, and part of it's because you don't absorb the nutrients as well. Um, if it's totally raw, like some of the minerals, you don't. I do like some raw because the fiber is really good, and fiber will certainly decrease your risk for colon cancer. It helps fill you up. Um, and so, you know, again, eating a variety. Anybody know what this is? Yes. How about this? This is the number one. No way. This is, the, I didn't think you'd get, this is the number one antioxidant rich vegetable. Watercress, the green leafy vegetable. I hope you're having watercress. Watercress is fabulous. So if nothing else that you remember, go buy watercress. Yeah, Safeway. What's this? Kale. Yes, listen to kale. Um, how about? Actually, you know what? I take this back. What is this and what is this? This is actually sorrel. This is, Susie? It's what? No, no, this isn't. Arugula, yes, arugula. But this is sorrel. How many of you tried sorrel? It has like this little lemony aftertaste, or salty lemony, I can't decide. It's really good. And what I do, or that, how about this? We all know this, right? Cilantro. Now some people have a genetic, um, not a defect, it's just genes that makes it taste soapy. Anybody here find cilantro tastes like? So that's okay. If it tastes soapy to them, you don't have to make them eat it. <laughs> Fortunately, and I, well, yeah. Oh, okay. well, see, they can't digest it. That's genetics, that's yeah. genes. Um, I have a client who's 26 and can't eat green leafy vegetables. She has a methylation defect, and that was my clue. It's like, you know, she's like, I just can't eat them. You know, they, they and that was part of it. Um, I put this in everything. I chop it in salads. I make, you know, I will have beans a lot, or, you know, I'll put, chop this in it. I chop it in everything. 
Um, now, this is really important. When you buy produce, ideally we want, what's the best kind you can buy? Organic. Organic. And ideally from a local farmer, you know, some, somebody nearby. I will tell you it's expensive to get the organic certification. So some local farmers use organic practices. They just can't say it's organic. But let's say you go to Whole Foods, where I bought these. Which one is organic and which one? Five digit number, PLU sticker or tag starts with a nine. This one's four digits, what does that mean? Conventionally grown. What's a five digit number that starts with eight? It's genetically modified. They won't tell you. At the moment, you know that we, you, they, there is no law that says that a product has to say it's genetically modified. But if it's produce, it has to have a PLU sticker on there, and it'll start with an 8. That's genetically modified. I tend to avoid those. What is it? So you juice? So juicing is a great way to get all of these maybe into one. Do you need to have all this in a day? Not necessarily. But it might be a good way to get, since we're trying to get 8 to 10. Um, I, ha I just want to make a caveat about juicing, because juicing can be great. The positives about juice is you can get a lot of vitamins and minerals in a, in, in a small concentration. But the way most people juice isn't the best way to juice, because they use a lot of fruit. And that's a problem, because it's a lot of sugar, and it's devoid of any of the fiber. And the benefit of fruit is the fiber. You know, you look at some of these fruits, huge amount of fiber. And I will tell you, there was a study that came out last year that said the number one way to kind of, that they found that caused plaque to not continue to grow in your arteries was the amount of fiber in their person's diet. Mm -hmm. So although juicing can be great, I prefer smoothing. I make smoothies all the time. So I will put this in my smoothie, and I usually will have a fruit, whether it's an apple or a frozen banana or frozen berries or fresh berries or whatever, and then I'll throw some of these in. I also like smoothies that have a little bit of avocado and lime juice um, that gets you some of the healthy fats. If I use a yogurt or a Greek yogurt, it'll be an organic um, one. And it can be, so a base can either be yogurt, um, coconut water, almond milk. I have a son who's allergic to dairy, and so we'd find other ways of getting calcium and liquid other than, obviously, dairy. Uh, and so, yeah, that's usually the base. And I use a lot of coconut water because there's a lot of potassium. And I will throw in there that sodium is related to blood pressure. And yes, you hear back and forth that, you know, yes, you need to reduce it really low. And others will say you don't need to reduce it as much. It really determines, it, de it depends on where you start from. And they actually have found that, well, the Heart Association recommends 1,500 milligrams a day. It's very, very intensely low. They have found studies that are done by good researchers that say 2,300 if you're not eating processed food, is what you're eating is about right. But instead of focusing so much on sodium, it's the balance between sodium and potassium. So if you can raise your potassium intake, you don't have to worry quite as much about sodium. That doesn't mean you can have you know, your Big Mac and coconut water, but you want to balance the two. Does that, yes? Well, you can eat too much of anything. I mean, you drink too much water and you get brain swollen. Kale is great. It's you know, a good source of vitamin K. Of course, anytime something gets glorified, somebody's looking at, what can I tear down to get more hits? You know, and they'll do that. You know what I recommend is a variety. I don't want kale every day. Um, I want, you know, because you also have certain chemicals like oxalic acid or phytic acid that comes in grains or greens that can bind with calcium or affect your thyroid, et cetera. So I use a variety. You know, I, I mean, I will use different greens. I don't always green, in, I don't put greens always in my smoothie because I, I have greens at dinner. We, every night we have greens, a salad and some kind of cooked greens. So I don't feel I need to also add it to my smoothies. What do you think of those greens powder? I put them in smoothies. Do you think that's effective? Or so green powders, yeah. you just want to be careful because I was looking at some in the market. They're not all organic. Okay. And so if you're you using, okay, then that's fine. Yeah. Um, but I would rather have it from produce because we haven't, you know, having powder is not the equivalent of this. It's not the equivalent. I mean, if you want to add it, that's fine. Make sure that it's organic, otherwise you're concentrating the pesticides. So we're talking about some specific nutrients. I do want to tell you, as we get older, we lose muscle mass, in case you didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about 1% to 2% of muscle mass per year. Mm -hmm. That's really significant. That's one of, the reason why, one of the reasons why we gain weight as we get older, because the muscles are what burn calories. It's our powerhouse. And if you're losing muscle, even if you exercise normally, then you're calorie needs go down. 
And if you don't decrease your calories or you don't increase your exercise to maintain muscle, then we gain weight. That's one of the reasons how it happens. And so what a lot of researchers will say is that you don't want to just have what's recommended as a normal 0.8 grams per kilograms of protein. That you really need, I, I just give kind of an average of 60 to 80 grams. And if you kind of think of that as a ballpark, because I have a lot of women who come to me eating 30 grams a day. Because they eat a lot of vegetables and they have some protein, but not a lot. And they don't have enough protein. So you want to aim more for 60 to 80 grams of protein. If, you, um, if you're sick, you need even more for healing. But what's important isn't just that you get 60 to 80 by the time you go to sleep. You want to balance it throughout the day. If you get less than 15 at a time, it's not really going to help your muscle or your bones. And, and protein is important for muscle and bones. So you want to get at least 20 at breakfast and at least 30 at lunch and dinner. Maybe a little bit at your snack, and that's how you get it in. Oh, so speaking of smoothies, has anybody put cottage cheese in a smoothie? I don't even like cottage cheese, and I put cottage cheese in smoothies sometimes because you can't tell it's in there. And you get you know, a good source of um, protein. I like daisy cottage cheese because it doesn't have all the extra stuff in there. It's just pretty simple. So um, cottage cheese, you put in there for protein. You can put a protein powder. I will say if you look for protein powder, I, whey is good. It's very well absorbed. Um, some people use soy. I like hemp protein. Pea protein is very good. I like to get an organic one. And part of that is, well, for a lot of reasons, but I also want like a whey protein concentrate, not an isolate. And there are a couple of reasons for that, because protein has a lot of amino acids, and I want them all. I want the whole protein. I don't want it denatured so that my body can use it to make new proteins, immune cells, muscle cells, skin, etc. And uh, another reason not to use the isolate is it looks like it has more protein, and sometimes it will. They'll throw in more amino acids. But what some companies do that are a little less than, they aren't very scrupulous, they will throw in amino acids because when we measure the protein content of something, what do we measure? Nitrogen, because nitrogen is only in protein. So you can measure the nitrogen and then extrapolate and say, oh, this is how much protein's in there. So they do something called um, protein spiking. They throw amino acids to make it look like it has more protein, but it's not really bioavailable protein. So you just want to be careful of that, get a good quality. Like I don't like the protein powders at Trader Joe's, for instance. I don't think they're very good. Isn't it best just to stay clear? I don't trust any of them. <laughs> well, I do. I mean, I, there are a couple that I like, yes, but not most of them. I'd rather get it from food, food first, right. always, uh, because food has a lot more nutrients, and we haven't discovered all of them, and, they, and the nutrients work synergistically in foods. So a lot of people, well, not a lot, some people just rely on powders and supplements, and that's not a good way either. But some people need supplements, and they need to enhance what they're eating. But again, it's enhancing what they're eating, not living, like, living off that. Yeah. So do you, what do you think for women sort of our collective age, what do you think about the pattern of three meals a day versus like three meals and two snacks? Or I'd be curious what your thoughts are. See, th I, and I like this kind of question because it comes down to genetics. What works best for you? And when I'm working with somebody, if, if you're fine health-wise and weight-wise, then it's working for you. And I personally can't eat just three meals a day. I don't like to eat a huge amount at once, but I'm really hungry when the kids come home from school. And I like to eat with them. I always give them a really kind of mini meal then, and I have to eat them so I can get through to the rest of my day. So you have to look at what works best for you. And you know, now somebody who's insulin resistant, you don't want them eating five, six small meals because they're constantly raising their insulin. It'd be better to have healthy fats and proteins and fewer meals a day. So I, I kind of look at it. It's, most everything is really individualized, and that's why I like gene testing. Um, and there are some companies that will look at your genetics more than just the MTHFR I was telling you about. I mean, they can look at how you metabolize things. You know, if you have a low vitamin D, it's because you have a vitamin D receptor problem. You know, they can, can look at all that so that you can then better be proactive at taking care of your health before something pops up like some illness or osteoporosis because you didn't realize that you had a problem. Um, there are specific dietary patterns like the MIND diet. Um, that's really kind of a Mediterranean and DASH combination. DASH diet was I don't know, 20 years ago now. It was really dietary approaches to stop hypertension. It's basically produce. It's your antioxidants. It's not having a lot of alcohol. It's not having high fat meats. And it's a little bit like the Mediterranean diet, quite frankly. And there have been really good studies on Mediterranean diet. And if I'm going to recommend a general diet, I'll say a Mediterranean diet is probably best for most people. <laughs> But not everybody, because there are some people who have a genetic marker called APOE. Anybody know what their APOE is in here? Okay. 
So you have ApoE2 or 3 or 4. ApoE4 is associated with Alzheimer's disease. You have an increased risk of getting Alzheimer's. So any of you here who have a parent with Alzheimer's, they either are, an, so you get a, a gene from each parent. So you can either have an ApoE, if a parent has Alzheimer's, they might have an ApoE4 and 4, which means you've got one of those. Does that mean you're doomed to Alzheimer's? What did we say in the beginning? No. If you have a healthy diet that's good for your heart, it will be good for your brain as well. And you can decrease your risk for getting Alzheimer's by eating a plant-based, unprocessed, whole food diet, basically. So paleo is very popular, but really, what is paleo? Because some people, paleo, eat a little bit of rice. and No, no, I know that. But what I'm saying is there isn't like a standard, this is paleo, that they vary a little. But it's basically no grains, it's a lot of produce, it's a lot of you know, lean meats, basically. And it can be very healthy. It depends on the person. I have some people who would die on a paleo because they need some grains, they digest those grains well, and it works for them. And then I have others, especially if they have metabolic syndrome, who really do much better on a paleo. You know, they do better because it's the protein. It's rich in all these fruits and vegetables as long as you eat them. Because I have some people who kind of follow the mantra of a paleo, but they aren't really eating a good variety of produce. So it really depends on the person. I'm not anti-paleo. And it's just you know, based on the, the individual person. And again, genetics kind of determine that as well. Uh, I was going to mention, so one of the other nutrients that we're looking at um, in terms of kind of maintaining your health is, let's talk about calcium. How many of you have heard that taking calcium can increase your risk for heart disease? There, those studies have come out. Well, I don't want to take calcium because it increases your risk for heart disease. And then other studies say, well, no, you really need calcium. It's part of your bone, et cetera. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you look at your risks. You look at what you're eating. Are you eating absorbable forms of calcium? Some people do need to take calcium. Um, how about vitamin D? How many of you take vitamin D? It's another nutrient we're talking about. And I'm tying all these together, which is why I'm asking. How many of you take vitamin D because your doctor told you or because your neighbor told you or you read it in something? So vitamin D is very important. It helps avoid memory de deficiencies or decline. It is associated with memory as is B12. You know that B12, like we've talked about, is the number one cause of memory problems? It's a nutrient, right? So, so lab ranges, because you're like, what? I thought that was fine. When you look at a blood test, there's always a range. Do you know where those ranges come from? They're a little bit arbitrary, and they differ. So blood sugar in San Diego is a lot lower than blood sugar in North Carolina. And North Carolina having a blood sugar of 130 is okay. Why? Because everybody there has high blood sugars. So this is how they come up with those ranges, <laughs> FYI. Um, so they will look at, and they, let's say you go to, um, let's say you all go to an exercise class and you take your shoes off and you all you know, do your thing and then you come back and you put shoes on. And then, but you didn't put your shoes back on. They looked like yours, but they were a size, two sizes too small. So your toes are hurting, and they're rubbing, and you're getting a blister. And you go in and say, doctor, my foot really hurts. Oh, I don't know. Your, your shoe size is normal. It's size 8. That's normal for a woman. But my, look at my foot. But your shoe size is normal. It can't be a problem. Because it's equivalent of looking, going into a mall, getting 100 people, measuring their shoe size, and saying, well, we'll take the top two off, because maybe they're athletes and you know, basketball players. Maybe the, the bottom two will take off, because they were just small people. And the rest is normal. But that doesn't mean healthy. Now, the Institute of Medicine says that if you have above 30, you're OK. But that's for bones. And vitamin D is much more important than just bones. It affects your immune system. It affects your brain health. It affects your heart. It affects your risk for getting a second heart attack. So if you look at functional medicine doctors or you look at more the research that looks at how to maintain good health, not just how to prevent a disease, 40 to 60 or even up to 80 is really what they look at as being ideal. It depends on where your level is. So the lower the level, the more you need to take. Now I had another client who we couldn't seem to get his, we couldn't get the vitamin D bumped up. Well, he had a lot of inflammation, so he couldn't absorb it. We got rid of the inflammation, and then his vitamin D levels started going up. So it's very complex. The sun, how many of you have been told to stay out of the sun? <laughs> or if you go in the sun, like if you go to the park and look at kids, they're slathered with sunscreen. We don't go in the sun anymore. So sun is great, but there is a risk for skin cancer. And as you get older, our skin thins. And you absorb vitamin D from your sunshine. From sunshine. It activates a chemical in your skin. And then it's still not vitamin D. It goes to your kidneys. It gets activated again. And then it goes to your liver. It gets activated again. Now, in that whole process, you may have trouble absorbing it. 
if you take it as a pill in your intestines, or absorbing it from the sun, or you may have a, con a genetic defect that affects a conversion in your kidneys or in your liver or whatever. That's why you want to know what the level is and then figure out wh why it may not be going up. But I will tell you, for those of you, does anyone here take just vitamin D and not vitamin anything else with it? Vitamin D. So if you look at, when you go home, look at your vitamin D. The reason why is nutrients work together, which is why foods obviously are important. But in this case, many people do have to take supplemental D. Well, this is the, the calcium and heart disease connection. So if you just take calcium, free calcium, it gets in your bloodstream. If it's not told to get into your bone, then it tends to linger in your bloodstream. And then what does it do? It contributes to plaque formation. It gets, can get into your joints right, and, and, and cause joint problems. And so you want to make sure if you take vitamin D, because it enhances calcium absorption, you also take vitamin K2, because vitamin K2 helps make matrix GLA protein, calcitonin, that help that vitamin, that calcium get into your bone so it doesn't linger in your bloodstream. So when researchers were initially looking at calcium and heart disease, they didn't know really about vitamin K2, so they said, oh look, all these women who took calcium got heart, you know, had an increased risk for heart disease. Well, because they didn't know the other piece of the puzzle, which was vitamin K2. But you also need magnesium. 80% of the population is deficient in magnesium. And so you want to make sure that you probably take magnesium, if, unless, you, I mean, you can certainly get magnesium-rich foods. And on the back, if you go to whfoods.com, world's healthiest foods, it has all kinds of listings of foods and their nutrient contents. So you can go see what magnesium-rich foods are in there. But you need to make sure you get enough because it makes the framework that calcium deposits on. Okay? So this is on your sheet. So what do we eat? So you want antioxidant-rich produce. You want avocados that have healthy fats. You do want to decrease your saturated fat. Now that's a big controversy, isn't it? How many of you think, oh, but you're supposed to eat coconut oil, da, da, da. Well, saturated fat will decrease LDL receptors, so the cholesterol tends to increase in your blood. And if it tends to increase, it can tend to get oxidized. That's when it can go bad. Oh, this uh, this test I was m mentioning, Boston Heart, they also look at the fatty acid composition of your cells. And for cells to be able to communicate well and have good integrity, they need to have good membranes. And so you want to make sure that, you're not, that it doesn't have too much saturated fat, because if it does, it's less fluid. It's less ability to communicate. Beans and other legumes have fiber. That's not on a paleo diet. But if you look at typical populations, they do really well. And, and it's associated with you know, longevity, it's high fiber. The berries for antioxidants, cruciferous vegetables actually support your liver's detox. You know, your liver has two phases of detoxification where it takes fat-soluble chemicals and it water, makes them water-soluble. And that first phase of soluble, water-solubilizing them uses cruciferous vegetables. We'll help with that. Cru cruciferous vegetables. It's like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, etc. Cabbage, yeah, cabbage. Fermented foods, I don't even have time to get into fermented foods, but you know, if you like kimchi, add some to your salad or something because they're, it's rich in probiotic bacteria which will help your gut. Um, again, protein rich foods, I prefer organic. The fatty acid profile is better, um, just for a variety of reasons. And then fish, <coughs> I do recommend, bless you, eating two or servings or more of fatty fish. The omega-3 fats also can lower triglycerides if triglycerides are an issue. It's anti-inflammatory. If you take um, fish oil supplements, just be careful that you get them. I usually get them from the source because I don't know how long it took to get to a store and how long it was on their dock before they put it on the shelves and how long it's been sitting on the shelves. And, and fish, as you know, goes rancid very quickly. You know, once the fish is caught, it's now pro it's the process of breakdown. So I want to make sure that it's very fresh. A variety of nuts. You know, people think that you know nuts are very fattening, but the studies that have been done, if you eat an ounce of nuts a day, here's like an ounce of almonds, um, that they find that it lowers heart disease associated with actually lower weight. But you'll notice that this is an ounce. And so the way to eat nuts is not out of the bag when you're watching TV or something, or you're reading a magazine, but it's to actually put an ounce in oatmeal if you like because then the oatmeal doesn't leave you hungry an hour later because it has some healthy fats, or incorporate it as part of a snack or have nut butters, which is another good way. Um, and then the, have flavors, you know, garlic, onions, fresh herbs, you know, like rosemary. It doesn't take much, and it just smells so good, and it makes your food taste good. Extra virgin olive oil, I do prefer that. Um, you will see sometimes 
How many of you have heard that you should cook with coconut oil because it has a high smoke point? It does not have a high smoke point. You can look it up anywhere. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and you just want to be careful. Um, so I like extra virgin oil. I don't heat it up very much. Um, and then dark chocolate. I just saw a study this week that it doesn't even, it, dark chocolate has more benefits, but even milk chocolate has some benefit. So it's not like you can only have dark chocolate. <laughs> I've, I've alluded to these already, um, but I just wanted to make sure that with the probiotics, there are some probiotics like lactobacillus ruteri that helps lower cholesterol. So you don't always have to take a medication, but if you know that there are good research studies that show that certain pro probiotics can help, you might want to do that. Curcumin is an anti-inflammatory, the active ingredient in turmeric. It's been shown to decrease inflammation. It's a pain, it can relieve pain as much as an NSAID, like ibuprofen. Without, see NSAIDs, ibuprofen will wreck your gut bacteria as well. So if you can find something that's a little bit more natural. Ideally, you want them eating these. And there are ways, and that's a whole nother lecture. I have three sons from you know, 20, 17, and 11. It took my 11-year-old two years to eat a salad. But that's what was there on the table every night when they were hungry, before because dinner wasn't quite ready. Um, and so eventually they learn. I make it interesting. Uh, I can say after and tell you, because I am now running out of time. <laughs> um, so that, that's the key. And ideally, you want to teach them to eat a variety of foods. Calcium, we talked about fish oil, vitamin D. <coughs> Um, vitamin B12 we talked about, bless you. Um, there are so many others, even selenium. You know, it's important for thyroid function. For any of you who have thyroids, this is another test that you might want to look at. For anybody whose thyroid isn't optimal, you want to know more than TSH, because TSH isn't even a thyroid hormone. It's a pituitary hormone that tells your thyroid to make more thyroid hormone or not. But your thyroid makes T4, which is an inactive thyroid hormone. It has to get converted to three to T3. So I always like to know what the free T3 is. That's my active, feel-good, energy-producing hormone. And I've had people who had normal TSHs, but they didn't feel good. They just didn't feel well. And when we did further testing, we saw, well, because this one woman was anemic, and iron's required to convert T4 to T3. So she didn't have enough active thyroid hormone because she was anemic. So that's something else to look for. So this is on your handout as well, and this is, they're all important, it's not necessarily in any particular order, although number one is you do want to eat more produce, so find ways to do it the best you can, eat a variety, and build, and it will help build um, a healthy microbiome. Don't let your protein intake go underway, um, consume enough omega-3s from fish and or supplements, avoid the added sugars and sweetened beverages because that sugar is very, anti is very inflammatory. I think it's all kind of pretty self-explanatory. Reshape your plate means just make half at least produce. Hydrate well, drink enough water. Um, alcohol, you know, there are some studies that say, yes, it's, it's beneficial. It has resveratrol, but so do black grapes. If you like alcohol, you can enjoy, but it's a serving for women, no more, and two for men per day. But remember, it does kill off some bacterial cells in your intestines, some good ones. Okay, so I just want to leave you with Aren't they adorable? But they're all wrinkled. <laughs> so what I want you to realize is that aging is, yes, it's about good nutrition and, and, and you know, delaying some of the aging process, but it's also about attitude. And what I'm learning is, is that even wrinkles can be cute. <laughs> but this dog didn't wake up and say, oh, you know, I'm so wrinkled. Um, that I want you to focus, because we all here have the potential to be healthier, to affect the world around us, our children. And if you start making healthier choices, you'll feel better. And it's, it's contagious. And the better you feel, the better you want to feel, and the better you want to eat. So this is just sort of my summary, in that the food and lifestyle choices you make, including good sleep, I mean, this is nutrition, not sleep, but if you don't get enough sleep, you're going to be hungry more often. You're going to have more stress hormones, no matter how much produce you eat. And that you, you can outsmart the aging process, that you can do that. And I like Hippocrates, you know, the father of medicine said, leave your drugs in the chemist pot if you can heal the patient with food. We, we've known this for a long time. And I don't know who said this, but I saw it. And so that's why it's in quotes, because it's not me. But um, starting today, I want to forget what's gone, appreciate what still remains, and look forward to what's coming next, which is, again, about attitude. 
and appreciate what, what, where you are in this particular phase of life and make the most of it. It's challenging probably for all of us, but I just wanted to leave you with that note right there. Any questions? <laughs>